Welcome to Daz Geek. Ever since covering on Hardware Addicts, the fact that I got one of these Apple MacBook M1 Air devices, people have been asking me questions about how I like the device and how it's working so far. And of course, comparing it to devices that I have in the same family line, like the HP Dragonfly Elite and wondering which one of these ultra portables is the best. So if you're one of those individuals, this video is for you. And if you're not, go check out the Hardware Addicts podcast, where we talk about all the great hardware and innovations and things happening in the tech world. But for today, we're going to talk about my experience the past month playing with this Apple MacBook M1 device and what I think about it. Now, what's interesting is this is probably one of the most hyped devices out there on the planet. The YouTubers and social media went crazy when Apple released their new M1 Silicon, and a lot of that was justified. There are some amazing innovation in here. But in this video, I'm going to talk about the good stuff, the bad stuff, and the ugly stuff. We're going to go through this hardware in a way that other YouTube channels don't dare because they don't want to possibly affect their ability to get that free equipment sent to them for review purposes, whereas I'm going to tell you the nitty gritty details in here. Now, you may think I'm biased because I love Linux, and I do love Linux, but I also like Apple products a lot. But there's some caveats to that. We're going to get into all of this right now in this video. So let's get started and check out the tech specs. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the specs. We'll go through this kind of quickly. Again, you can check out Hardware Addicts if you want the nitty gritty detail and comparisons to other CPUs out there. But this is Apple's own silicon. Instead of using the Intel based processors, they went with their own ARM Apple M1 chip. And this has an eight core CPU, four performance cores, four efficiency cores. Why is that important? Those efficiency cores are really quite amazing, coupled with the 16 core neural engine, which allows this to really intelligently make decisions on power consumption and be able to extend the battery life. One of the things you'll hear about this device over and over and over again is it has the most amazing battery life of any device out there. And you know what? They're not wrong. I can't think of a single other device that has more battery power than this device, especially in this thin ultra portable form factor here. You have 16 billion transistors in the Apple M1. So this is quite an innovation and you have your CPU, GPU, your RAM, everything built on a single board here. This is a problem for repairability, but we'll get into that a little bit later. In this particular device that I have, I have eight gigabytes of memory. That's LPDDR4 memory, a 2560 by 1600 Retina LCD, which is quite beautiful and gorgeous. We'll compare that to the 4K screen inside the Dragonfly Elite. And I think you'll see that it's quite comparable to those screens, but the Dragonfly Elite has a beautiful screen as well. And it's touchscreen, which you're not gonna get in any Apple products. You have a seven core GPU in some instances, an eight core GPU, which kind of confused me because in the spec sheet here, it talks about a seven or eight core. I think I have the seven core GPU based on the system readout specs that I have. You have 18 hours of battery life, and I'll tell you, it will hit that and even more depending on your usage of this device and only six hours to charge it. You get a magic keyboard, of course, which is one of the best typing experiences out there. Again, the Dragonfly Elite also has an amazing, beautiful keyboard, a uh, glass trackpad. You only get two times USB-C and headphone jack, and that's it. Unlike the Pro line where they actually started bringing back some ports, in this, you're only getting those two USB-C. So if you need to charge it on the other side, you're out of luck because they're all on one side and you may have to, depending on where your outlet is, route that cord all the way around your MacBook to plug it in, which makes it quite inconvenient, but that's just what they decided to do. You get your fingerprint reader, Wi-Fi 6 and stereo speakers. And of course your microphone is beam forming. It's a three mic array, which is really nice in this device. Look, at the end of the day, the quality in a MacBook Air remains the same. You get that beautiful aluminum, unibody frame, you get the glass trackpad, a really nice screen, good speakers, things that I talked about in my coverage when I spent 30 days with Mac, Apple devices, they all have a really premium feel and this is no exception. Of course, one thing I would have loved to seen physically in this device is that Apple logo glowing, that glowing Apple logo on the back of the LCD. I know it may be just a me thing, but I always missed that. It was so iconic when they did that back in the day. So those are the tech specs. Now we're gonna talk about, because this is a new chip and new architecture, what apps work on this and what apps don't. Now I think Apple has done an absolute amazing job 
with their emulation layer, making sure as many apps as possible are available and working on this device out of the box. And I had a very similar experience as an open source enthusiast. A lot of the apps that I use actually worked on this device out of the box. And that's very important to me because open source not only helps close the digital divide, but it also provides better privacy and security. And I don't have to worry about what the software is doing behind the scenes, stealing all my data. So as a privacy enthusiast and security enthusiast, I prefer open source software. And thankfully, I didn't have to give up a lot to be working on the Apple M1, even though Mac OS itself, of course, is not open source, but still they provided some things to the open source community like the Cups print server. But let's look at the apps that work. Blender, for instance, Firefox, Steam, although you're gonna have a very limited selection of games in Steam and Apple just has a problem. They're using Metal instead of Proton. So Linux has kind of become second in gaming right under Windows as far as compatibility and the games you can play. Macs over here trailing in third. And that's kind of a shame. They do have their own game service, but then again, you're going to have to pay for that. And you're not talking AAA games here that your friends are playing. You're just talking about kind of mobile like games. There are some good ones there, but I talk about that more in the 30 days I spent with Apple there. Bitwarden, which is a sponsor of this episode of along with DigitalOcean, but Bitwarden is the best password manager on the planet that works here out of the box. I'm talking about their app, not just the browser plugin itself. You got GIMP, Element, Docker, League of Legends. Docker again has some limitations, which we'll get into. Uh, LimeChat, ProtonVPN, Tor Browser, Firefox, Qubit Torrent, Visual Studio Code, Krita, Sublime Text, MegaNZ, Handbrake, Discord, OBS, Tiger VNC. Although this one had some issues where it would uh, crash if you clicked on options and things, it still worked in there. So most of the core software that I needed, whether it was an IDE programming platform, whether it was doing some art and things with GIMP or Krita, they all worked in Blender with animations, but I did have some things that didn't work. Of course, most games are not gonna work. Uh, emulation works well for the most part, but you're not gonna get VirtualBox on this either. So if you're a VirtualBox fan and you want to run some virtual servers or, or virtual desktops, you're not gonna be able to do that through VirtualBox. And apparently there are no plans for them to support it, but you can use QEMU, which is also free, or you could just pay more money and buy Parallels. And you're gonna find that a lot in the Apple ecosystem that just spend more money and you'll get stuff. And we could talk about that with its OBS support, because even though it has OBS support, Mac does not allow you to record desktop audio, even though every other operating system on the planet lets you do that, not with Mac OS. You'd have to buy a separate package to allow you just to record your desktop audio. It surprises me so many people in the audio world prefer Macs, but I guess that's just for the software that's available on them uh, that you're just going to pay more money for. It's just everything seems to be a little bit of a money grab, which is unfortunate. Caden Live does not work, which is an amazing open source video editor, unfortunately. And Docker images that don't run on ARM, like MySQL and things, will not work on this device. So if you're somebody who's using the ever emerging and growing Docker uh, for your work or for your own business, you're not going to be able to have a lot of fun with this, depending on the type of Docker images that you're trying to run. Um, then things like Safari, it's a great browser. I love it. But again, if you're not in the whole Apple ecosystem, you can't put Safari on your other devices. Let's say you have a mixed environment where you have Windows and maybe Macs or Linux, you're not going to be able to use Safari on all of those. Apple kind of keeps that to themselves. And that's unfortunate. So you're probably going to put another browser on there. Thankfully, you can do that. And it's not as annoying as Microsoft, where every time you put a new browser on, it's like, please stay here with Edge, please. So there are some advantages uh, there and some good things that Apple's doing. So real quick, let's talk about all the pros we found. We have an insane battery life. It never gets hot like the Intel variants. That top panel on the Intel MacBook Airs would get really, really hot, uncomfortable to touch hot. The four performance cores, the four efficiency cores in the M1 do a fantastic job of balancing itself out and it's fanless so you don't have any noise there. Just beautiful on that. While it is limited on ports, and that's something I think they should fix on the airline, again, they did better on the pro lines there, at least you're getting USB-C and USB-4 support on this device, so you can do your Thunderbolt devices and things like that, so you're getting good speed on them, but they really need to add more ports. A micro SD, HDMI, wouldn't kill them to add that into this device. You have great backlit, magic keyboard, amazing glass trackpad with awesome gesture support, really a fantastic feel in Mac OS overall. I love mission control, the multiple desktop options and things like that. When we talk about cons though, the biggest con that I have to say is I would never buy an Apple product brand new. And one of the reasons for that is they have a severe 
supply chain issue. Not only are the working conditions for those that we know about of those who produce these devices terrible. And if you want to look into more of that, I have an entire video talking about supply chain and slave labor and those type of things. And Apple does not have a fantastic track record here. Actually, the company that has the best track record in my research is HP, which is why I went and purchased HP Dragonfly Elite. And you can see my reviews on that device. And of course, you've seen some of the B footage comparing these two devices together. Very comparable device, not going to have the battery life, but a lot more power. And you're not going to have some of the restraints of being on an ARM based architecture there. The storage options are overpriced and weak for a current laptop in this range, 256 gigabyte starting point. This again, in my opinion, is them just trying to sell you that iCloud service, add other features to iCloud, make it something people want regardless, but stop skimping on the storage space. 256 is too little right now. Really the bare minimum, any laptop should come with is 512. In my opinion, if you have things like NTFS USBs with videos and pictures and stuff like that on them, you're not going to have the ability to pull this off easily, pull those devices or those pictures and things off of that easily onto this Mac. You'll need to install homebrew and then from the terminal work to install fuse. And that won't work either because NTFS 3G has been disabled because it requires closed source Mac fuse. Or you could just pay $19.95. Again, spend some more money and you could do some very basic things that every other OS does for free. That's kind of being in the Arco, the Apple ecosystem, which is a little bit strange. Um, I don't like that Apple doesn't let you make this device your own. You know, when you're playing games and things, everything's about buying into Apple architecture. If you want a game on it, just pay $4.99 for another subscription service for them or get your iCloud and all of this other money. If you want the virtualization or another OS, you got to buy parallels. And there's just so much that's like, just keep spending more money and you could do basic things. Or if you want to record your desktop audio in OBS, just spend more money. Uh, that type of stuff frustrates me and is a con. Um, a repairability on this device, everything's on a single chip. However, this did score better than some of Apple's previous. A lot of work has been done because Apple's been under so much pressure to improve the repairability. I'm so happy to see this. And this device, like for instance, taking out the battery is more of those 3M strip pull tabs instead of you know basically soldering the battery in or gluing it, I think is what they were doing, gluing the battery in before. So again, if something goes wrong with your RAM or other things that's all in that chip, you're in big trouble. You're gonna need somebody who has experience actually soldering and doing board level repair. With that, Apple has more parts available, so those specialized repair shops can actually do it. So there is slight improvement there, although Apple needs to do much more work in this arena. Uh, random slowdowns happen in certain cases. And again, I think this is the emulation layer, and overall they did amazing, but it's worth mentioning that at times, apps just kind of act weird. Uh, they will sit there and slow down, you'll get that pinwheel, for no reason, it'll kind of be sitting there thinking and then it'll clear itself up and everything works perfectly. Maybe it's the performance cores ramping up or again, that emulation layer having problems at time, but you'll run into that from time to time. But overall, performance was amazing. But just know, sometimes you're gonna kind of run into those little quirks thing. You kind of be wondering what's happening. Again, no touchscreen options. For a lot of people, that doesn't matter. If you get the Dragonfly Elite, you get a touchscreen. Uh, for those that it does matter for though, that's gonna be an issue here. You're gonna to have to get something like a Wacom tablet or something else if you're wanting to draw on the screen. And we mentioned the no USB-C on the right side of the device. Uh, so you might have to move you know, your cord over in order to charge it and things like that. So those are the cons of the device. Overall though, I really, really had a fantastic time with this. I think the build quality is fantastic. I think the integrations that they did with Mac OS, I think the fact that they have moved so much software, uh, whether it's emulation or natively in to support this so quickly is really an engineering feat on the Apple team's part. So they just did an absolute amazing job. Apple as a company needs some improvements to their supply chain. Uh, so again, I do not recommend you buy one of these new, but I'll have a link for the cover that I use and for this device used or where you could get one refurbished from Amazon links down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about the Apple M1. Do you have one? Do you have maybe the Pro out there and are absolutely loving it? Let me know in the comments below. I'm glad you're loving it. If you didn't get it out of this video because I talked about some of the cons, unlike many other YouTubers out there, I really like this device. I just think there's some things that they could do differently. If you want something like this, but a little different form factor, the HP Dragonfly Elite is definitely the closest competitor that I've found in the PC market. Does a beautiful job, absolutely amazing laptop that you can pick up for a good price used right now. So think about that as well. And I also want a special thanks to my sponsors, DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. 
DigitalOcean is the greatest cloud provider out there. If you need any app to run on architecture out there for your customers or you want to create static websites, go to DigitalOcean, do.co slash DLN, get $100 credit. And Bitwarden is the greatest password manager on the planet. And I'm not just saying that because they sponsor us. I was using them well before they sponsored. And everybody who was using all these other services and they've all had these crashes and breaches have been like, Ryan, Bitwarden, I should have been to Bitwarden. Listen to me, go to Bitwarden. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN so you know they know I sent you there and get that free password manager. You could get their $10 premium account, open source, super secure, third-party audits. Bitwarden's awesome. And a really special thanks to all my patrons out there. Thank you so much for your love and support. And until next time, get out there and fill your brains.